Okay, guys, yesterday was probably one of the worst days I've ever endured, and it all started with a phone call at about 7 a.m. I picked up my phone to see who was calling me so early, but since I didn't recognize the number, I just put it on silent and fell back asleep. When I woke up again three hours later, I saw that I had 12 missed calls and 8 new voicemails. Panic started to set in as I thought something horrible had happened to one of my family members. As I looked through all the missed numbers though, I realized that I didn't know who any of these people were. I thought that was really strange since if something bad had happened to a family member, I should at least recognize one of these numbers. Things got weirder as I heard the first voicemail. Hi, I was just giving you a call about the house you have for sale. I saw the Craigslist ad and was hoping to figure out a time I could be given a walkthrough. Just give me a call back, thanks. I figured that was the wrong number and played the next one. Yeah, hi. I was calling about the house for sale on Craigslist. If you could, give me a call back. I'd really like to know some more stuff about those murders before I take a walkthrough. Thanks, and have a nice day. After hearing the second voicemail, I was really starting to wonder what the hell is going on here. The other six voicemails were all pretty much the same thing, inquiring about setting up a walkthrough and wanting to know about these quote unquote murders. After I finished listening to the last one, I needed to find out what the fuck is going on. I called the last number to leave a voicemail and a woman answered. When I asked her about the house she was calling about, she said there was an ad on Craigslist offering a house for dirt cheap, but it was only so cheap because the post said that a couple had been murdered inside the house. I asked her if she could text me the link and she assured me that she would. A few minutes later, my phone buzzed and I saw her number pop up on its screen. I had no idea what I was in store for by clicking on that link. So when the web page opened, the coldest chill I've ever felt shot down my spine. I saw a picture of my house on Craigslist for sale. What made it worse was it was the picture that had been taken within the last week. You could see the pumpkin that I carved last weekend. And then I read the posting description. I have this sweet little home that I'm putting up for sale. It's located in this town. Just a hop, skip, and a jump away from the city. Enjoy all the seclusion and privacy that this house will bring you. My asking price is 25000 Disclosure, there is a reason I'm asking basically nothing for my house. The previous couple who lived there, a young man and a woman, were murdered in the house about a year ago. I figured it would get out in the open now so that I'm only contacted by people who are not bothered by this. Don't let this little mishap dissuade you though. The neighborhood is very safe. I promise. You can call, then they listed my name and number at any time, day or night. I never sleep and we can set a time to take a walkthrough of my house. I look forward to hearing from you soon, with a winky face. I felt like I'd been socked in the gut. What the fuck is going on? How did they know my number, my name? I immediately called my girlfriend over to see. I could see the horror set in on her face as she looked through the ad. I don't think I could feel any worse until she pointed out how our car was in the picture. We were in the house when someone took these pictures. I immediately called the police to figure out what the hell to do. They informed me that I should immediately contact Craigslist to remove the posting. Other than that, there was nothing really we could do at the moment. The only crime that had technically been committed would be trespassing, but since whoever took that picture wasn't on our property anymore, they really couldn't do anything else. I'm freaking the hell out. My girlfriend was on the phone with her mom in hysterics for most of the day yesterday. Today. We've just been on constant alert. Every sound we hear makes us jump. I think the worst part is, I know there's really nothing I can do. I feel so violated and so completely helpless. When I was 21, I transferred to a college in San Francisco. I checked out a room for rent on Craigslist. It was a really nice two bedroom apartment. The rent was cheap and close to campus, so it was kind of the ideal spot. The girl who lived there was 29 and her name was Beth. She was tall and wide and she had jet black hair and wore pale makeup. She seemed nice, although a little quiet, but she seemed to like me and agreed to let me move in. So, so far so good. My first night there, we went out for pizza. And that's when I can tell there's something a little bit off with her. 
Throughout dinner, she kept telling me how much I looked like Shia LaBeouf. I didn't know what to say, so I just shrugged it off with, uh, thanks? I mean, I looked nothing like Shia LaBeouf, so it just didn't make any sense to me. When we got back home, she asked if I'd seen her room yet. I said no, and she took me to see it. Shocking. Her walls were completely covered in posters of Shia LaBeouf. She even had printed out photos of him all over her mirror. She owned all of his movies. I really didn't know what to make of all this. It was definitely creepy. And the whole night, she'd been saying how I looked like him, and now it's obvious to me that she's completely obsessed with the guy. A few weeks passed. I never really saw her that much. We didn't spend much time together really at all. She would come home from work and practically run into her room, and she would spend most of the night in there. She had this creepy high-pitched giggle, and I would hear her giggling through the walls at night. I wondered what the hell she could possibly be doing. Occasionally, she would come out of her room and talk for like maybe two minutes, and she would always be slurring her words, so I suspected she was drinking a lot, and sometimes she wouldn't say anything. She would just stand in the hallway and watch me through the living room. I would turn and see her and be surprised and say, um, hello Beth. And then there would be this long awkward pause and she would give out her creepy high pitched giggle. It was very uncomfortable being around her. She gave me the chills. One night I woke up at around 2am because I heard what sounded like the front door being unlocked. I came out of my bedroom and all the lights were off, but I could still see Beth standing at the front door. She had her face against it, and she was turning the lock back and forth, over and over again. And every time she turned the bolt, she mumbled my name. Max Barker. Max Barker. Max Barker. Seeing her standing in the dark, mumbling my name, really freaked me out. It doesn't help that she looks like a bigger version of the girl from the ring. I just quietly went back to my room and tried to go back to sleep. One night, I was watching Gladiator, and she fumbled out of her room and turned on the living room light, forcing me to pause the movie, which was really annoying. Then she asked if I wanted to hear about her ex-boyfriend. It was an uneasy segue into the topic, but I just said, sure, then awkwardly sat back to listen. Ten minutes into her story, and she was so riled up, she was screaming at the top of her lungs about their breakup. And I was worried that the neighbors were going to call the cops. And she wasn't listening to me when I asked her to please lower the volume. I missed all of her screaming. One thing she said really freaked me out. She was in such a fit and yelled, I'll slit his fucking throat. That was a big game changer. Suddenly, I had no idea what this girl was capable of. She really, and was, practically just a stranger and everything I'd seen thus far was becoming alarmingly disturbing. After a few more minutes, she told me thank you for listening, and then started doing her giggle once more. I got out of there pretty fast and went to my room to go to sleep. I had a really uneasy feeling about being in the house with her now, and what's worse, there's no lock on my bedroom door. I pushed the edge of my dresser in front of it to act as a little barricade. I woke up in the middle of the night, to the sound of my dresser scraping against the floor. Beth was pushing the door open. I turned on my light, shouting at her to stop. I could see her through the opening of the door. She was so drunk and had this insane look in her eyes. Pushed the door closed and yelled at her to go back to bed. I could hear her walk back to her room, but I couldn't tell if she fell back asleep. The next morning when I went out into the hallway, my heart dropped. I saw one of her steak knives was on the floor by my door. I got goosebumps all over my arm, and all I could think about was when she said she would slit her ex-boyfriend's throat. I confronted her about it, and she said she didn't even remember trying to push my door open. She said she didn't even remember telling me about her ex-boyfriend. I've had enough. My lease was month to month, so I found a new spot and moved out. About a month after I moved out, she contacted me. I was at the movies and my phone was off. When I got out, I turned my phone on. And to my shock, I received about 40 plus text messages that she'd sent me over the past two hours. They were all just insane texts that ranged from everything in between, Hi, how are you? To, I fucking hate you. It was insane. 
I didn't respond and I never heard from her again. I always wonder if I hadn't set my dresser in front of my door, would she have quietly come into my room and slit my throat? Yeah, still freaks me out, man. I was new to a big city and decided I didn't need my car anymore, so I listed my six-year-old Honda Accord. A fairly normal, well-dressed man comes over to see it after a few phone calls back and forth about it. He's in his early 40s and his name is James. He claimed he's buying it for his daughter in college. I always have my guard up when I'm dealing with strangers, but so far, James is personable and seems legitimate. He test drives it with me. He does a thorough inspection. He negotiates the price with me for a while. He asked me to hold the car for two days so he can get the money and come pick it up. I agree. A two day hold where I won't sell it to someone else. Two days later, James follows up and we meet up again. It's a normal day, normal neighborhood, in an urban city. James and I test drive the car one more time. He gives me a Chase Bank cashier's check which I said was fine. I tell him he needs to come to the bank with me to cash this check and to get the title notarized over to him. This is when he starts acting nervous. We're pulled over on the side of the street discussing this. James is in the driver's seat and me as a passenger. I figured if he was going to steal my car, he would have done so two days earlier. So at this point, I'm fairly comfortable with the guy. He asked me to do one more car inspection with him, then we'll go to the bank. I agree, but I'm set on doing the transaction at the bank. As we both get out to inspect the car once again, he jumps back in and floors it as I try to get back in with him. He pulls away quicker than I can react, the passenger door wide open. I try to run after him, then realize I'm not as fast as a car. There are bystanders and I hysterically ask someone to call 911. Thankfully one guy does. I had my phone, but my adrenaline was through the roof and I didn't even think of it in the moment. As I'm on the stranger's phone with dispatch, an undercover cop car with two officers pulls out of an alley five feet from me. I wave them down and hysterically explain my story. They tell me to hop in the back of the car, to which I do. I implore them to hurry and we can catch this guy. He just drove off. I explain the car, the plate, everything. They assure me that they will not go on a high-speed chase with me in the car, but will radio it in to surrounding officers, which they do. The guy does end up getting away, and the officers drop me back off at the police station to file a report. I file an insurance claim too, and I'm so mad at myself for letting this happen. I suppose it's better than if I was in the car with this guy, but I'm still mad. Of course, James, the cell phone doesn't work. It was a burner. I go through insurance and their protocols to ensure that I'm not committing fraud for about three months or so. The week I'm supposed to get paid, I get a call from the police. They found my car, three states over. James was working with a partner in crime. I don't remember his name, so let's call him Dickface. James stole the car and gave it to Dickface to sell so it wasn't traceable back to James. And Dickface would have plausible deniability if he was ever questioned. Well, Dickface sold my car to an average Joe who actually did have a daughter in college who needed it. The daughter tried to register a new car at the DMV and it came up with stolen. So the cops arranged for me, Average Joe, and Dickface to meet up with them at the station for a little chat. Dickface denies any involvement with James, but agrees to give us the money back that Average Joe paid him, if he can just leave without any problems, so we all agree to this. Average Joe and I say his daughter can keep the car, and I'll take the money from Dickface. So, eventually I did get paid for my car, but this whole experience sucked, and it was very stressful. And since then... I have bought and sold cars on Craigslist again. So I guess no lesson was really learned. Except now I take a photo of the driver's license of all the people I interact with. At the start. I was moving out of an apartment and needed to sell my washer and dryer. I ended up having separate buyers for each. The guy who bought the dryer was great. He was getting it for his daughter who was going to college. I helped him load it up in his truck, he gave me the payment, and I never heard from him again. The guy who bought the washer was a completely different story. I got a text from him, asking if it was still available. 
We haggled the price, all normal stuff. Then we set a time and I waited for him to get there. Now, I only had one week left in the apartment, so I didn't care too much about random people coming to my home like I normally would. Pretty much all my stuff was moved into my new place, but the internet wasn't turned on yet, so I was still sleeping on an air mattress in the old one for the time being. He ended up being a few hours late and showed up in a truck that was used for transporting large glass panes. He had like five people with him all crammed into the front bench seat of the truck. They loaded it into the truck with it leaning at like a 30 degree angle against the glass pane rack or whatever you call it. Again, he tried to haggle it down to a lower price, but I, I didn't budge. He left and I thought it was all done. Later that night, I start getting texts from him about how the washer doesn't work and he wants his money back. I told him as it was written in the post that I put up. It sold as is and was working at the time. I can only assume that he damaged it in the way he rigged it up on that truck. Well, after a day, he starts calling me and cussing me out, texting death threats. And I have random numbers calling me doing the same thing all day and night. Two days after I sold it, I wake up at 3am with people banging on my door yelling. Luckily, I lived on the second floor with no easy access to the windows. I just sat there for about 15 minutes while they continued to yell through the door. The next day, I moved the rest of my stuff into my new apartment. And never went back there other than to turn my keys in. I still got calls and texts from him and other random numbers for two months over a $150 washer. And goes without saying, I don't sell stuff on Craigslist anymore. Thanks for listening if you stuck around at this point. If you haven't yet, please hit the like button, the subscribe button, and that notification bell to get notified when future episodes come out. I also have a new membership tier, $5 a month, gets you extra perks, extra emojis, and you'll get bonus content throughout the month. I've yet to put anything out yet, but I promise that it's coming. Just give me a little bit of time, but that's an option if you want to support me. $5 a month, it's a buy me a beer type of thing. Really simple, really easy. Don't feel obligated to do so. Just putting that option out there. Um, you can stalk me on Twitter. You can stalk me on Facebook. And you can also stalk me on Instagram. If you have a true scary story of your own, feel free to send it to my email or post it to my subreddit. All these links are below. What's up, guys? How you doing? Do you love me? Do you love this? Do you love this episode? Do you love it all? Yeah, sure. Oh, uh, mm, uh, mm, mm, mm. I don't know if you do. I hope you do. I like this one. I like Craigslist stories. They're really hard to find, but I found a couple. So this is a cool episode, shorter episode, but I bet you weren't expecting it because I wasn't expecting to do it today, but I just got a wild hair up my ass this morning. I'm like, you know what? F it. I'm going to put another episode out there. Why not? So let's do it. Let me know, um, still didn't get enough, or I still need some more suggestions for the next themed episode, because after this one, I really don't know what I was going to do. Probably, I was going to do trucker stories, but I've done trucker stories. I would like to get something that I've yet to do. So, if you can come up with something that's kind of off the beaten path, something you don't hear, something you want to hear, please let me know in the comments below. And I will see you guys again tomorrow for the short, and then on Thursday for the true horror stories that you get every week. I'll see you then. Cheers.